On March 11, 2011, a powerful earthquake strikes off the northeastern coast of Japan. Hearts stop beating, and time stands still as the earth shakes furiously. <laughs> The energy released by the tumbler rips open the ground. <laughs> Buildings convulse. <laughs> the quake measures a magnitude nine the fourth strongest ever recorded in history. Over the last 20 years, major earthquakes elsewhere in the world have taken their toll on human lives and infrastructure, reducing buildings to piles of rubble. But in the city of Sendai, with a population of one million living relatively close to the epicenter of the March 2011 earthquake, buildings suffered little damage, not a single one collapsed. Further south in Tokyo, skyscrapers swayed but did not fail. Their structures resisted the violent quake. But this wasn't out of pure luck. It was the result of decades of technological innovation. Engineers are now moving one step beyond ensuring the structural integrity of buildings during earthquakes. Their objective is to minimize the damage that can occur inside a swaying structure. With advances in technology, one day soon, the buildings themselves will no longer shake. This technology already proved its worth. These giant dampers help protect a hospital close to the earthquake's epicenter. The shaking could still be felt, but inside the hospital there was little damage to medical equipment and procedures continued as usual. The hospital remained functional and medical staff were able to focus on responding to the disaster. We were able to take in every single patient who arrived at the hospital. This was possible only because the hospital didn't suffer any damage. The building's resistance was a huge factor. Japanese engineers are taking anti-seismic technology to new heights, making the buildings we work and live in stronger, more comfortable, and above all, safer. Welcome to the program. I'm Marc Carpentier. Have you ever experienced an earthquake? If so, you know how strange the sensation of the ground moving under your feet can be. It's an unsettling feeling, and even more so if you happen to be inside a building when an earthquake strikes. It reminds us that the power of Mother Nature is awesome and can be destructive. Japan sits on one of the most seismically active places on the planet. People in this country experience earthquakes on a daily basis. Most quakes are small, but some can be very powerful, like the Great East Japan earthquake of March 2011. Over the years, Japanese engineers have developed technology that can help a building resist to the shaking caused by earthquakes. Seismic building codes are constantly being upgraded, and modern buildings are now safer than ever before. On this edition of JTEC, we'll look at how technologies have changed over the last century and explore some of the most advanced anti-seismic applications developed by Kajima Corporation, one of Japan's largest construction companies. <laughs> I'm on the 51st floor of Roppongi Hills, uh, a skyscraper in the middle of Tokyo's entertainment district. And during the earthquake uh, on March 11, 2011, uh, most of the er uh, skyscrapers in Tokyo did sway, but we're told that this building didn't sway as much because of the anti-seismic technology that has been built in to this structure. And we're here to find out how that works. 
The 53-story Roppongi Hills Mori Tower is one of Tokyo's tallest skyscrapers. To understand why it fared so well during the earthquake, we asked the company that designed it to show us one of the building's most important features. So this is... Yes, this is the damper that absorbs the seismic shock waves. This is, looks really heavy. The damper is connected to the beams on the ceiling via a V-shaped steel frame. It's an integral part of the building structure. In what way do they actually interact with the structure of the building? Uh, let me show you on a scale model. The lower part here is the floor. When an earthquake strikes, the structure sways like this. The damper acts like a giant shock absorber, counteracting the building's rocking motion. The energy from the shock waves is transmitted through the V-shaped steel beams to a piston inside the damper. The damper's chamber is filled with oil. The piston compresses the oil, converting the kinetic energy of the swaying building into heat. This damper is capable of resisting 200 tons of pressure. The Mori Tower is equipped with 356 of these oil dampers. They account for only a small fraction of the building's total weight. So how well did this marvel of structural engineering absorb the shock waves of the March 2011 earthquake? This restaurant is located on the 50th floor. When the earthquake struck, about 20 patrons were enjoying a late lunch here. Tables were set, and piles of plates and countless glasses were stacked on top of the counters. There are many things here that could. Canada-san, you were actually working at this restaurant at the time of the Great East Japan earthquake. Can you explain to us uh, what happened uh, when the earthquake struck? まず最初は横に揺れまして、あとはぐるっと回るような状況でした。うん。え、ほぼテーブルの上のものは動きませんでしたので、はい、もう被害もほぼございませんでした。お、look oh, at these. <笑> What would have happened if the building had no dampers? This computer simulation offers some clues. The tower on the left shows the motion of the building as it was recorded during the earthquake. The one on the right simulates the same motion but without the dampers. The shock absorbing structure was able to reduce the amplitude of the oscillation by as much as 50%. Uh, this building, which would not have the, the oil damp, damper system, is still swaying quite a bit at seven minutes after the earthquake. And the actual building has almost stopped completely. So yes. The presence of oil dampers also allows the building to stabilize more quickly. When it comes to earthquake protection, Japan's building codes are among the strictest in the world. It's little wonder when you consider that earthquakes are a daily threat. The country lies at the junction of four tectonic plates. More than 10 quakes are registered on average every day. 20% of all major quakes of magnitude six or higher that occur on the planet happen in Japan. Japan sits at the junction of four tectonic plates. Stress builds up along the subduction zones where a plate moves under another. When the stress is suddenly released, an earthquake occurs. Earthquakes are so frequent, they have their place in popular culture and mythology. There's an ancient tale that describes how earthquakes are caused by a giant catfish whose back is the Japanese archipelago. Every time the catfish wriggles, the country shakes. And there's the saying, what we fear the most are earthquakes, fire, lightning, and old men. 
Why old men, I don't know. But the fact that earthquakes are at the top of the list is very telling of how scary they can be. Japan has had more than its fair share of killer quakes. In the last 100 years, it has experienced several of the world's most destructive quakes, including the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, the Great Hanshin Earthquake in 1995, and the more recent Great East Japan Earthquake of March 2011. Research into the phenomena began only after the Meiji Restoration in 1868. The Yokohama earthquake of 1880, a 5.5 magnitude, was not very severe, but it frightened foreign researchers in the country so much that it prompted them to establish the Seismological Society of Japan. Since then, scientists and engineers have learned lessons from each successive major quake. Technology and building codes have constantly been improving. To understand how technology can help protect a building and the people inside, we needed to find out how seismic waves affect a building. For that, we met with engineers at the Tokyo headquarters of Kajima Corporation. This computer-controlled mobile platform replicates the swaying motion of a building during an earthquake. I'll be experiencing two types of quakes based on data from major temblers that hit Japan in the last 20 years. The first one is the magnitude 9 earthquake of March 2011, as it was felt in the city of Ishinomaki, about 150 kilometers from the epicenter. The ground motion peaks a second time. Very unpredictable. Now it's getting a little more violent now. A little bit difficult to stay sitting on this chair. Next, I'll be experiencing the shaking of the magnitude 6.9 earthquake that devastated Kobe in 1995. The city sat right on the epicenter. Now this feels a lot more violent than the previous uh, earthquake. Oh, it's sort of quieted down now. No two earthquakes are alike. The seismic waves generated by an earthquake depend on many variables, such as the amount of displacement, geological formations, location, and depth of the subduction. In the case of the March 2011 earthquake, luckily not one skyscraper in Japan suffered severe damage. This proves that anti-seismic technology applied to modern high-rise buildings worked at protecting infrastructure. Tokyo skyscrapers stand as proud symbols of this megalopolis. Without anti-seismic technology developed over the last 50 years, this would be a very different scene. The Kasumi Gaseki building towers over a busy downtown neighborhood. At 147 meters tall, it was the city's first modern skyscraper and launched the start of a vertical construction boom. Tokyo's skyline was a lot different in the 1960s before the construction of the Kasumi Gaseki building. But confidence was rising in the post-war era the economy was growing at a rate of 10% a year, and the Tokyo Olympic Games were fast approaching. At that time, buildings were low-rise because of civil codes that restricted the construction of high-rises. But in 1963, the laws regulating the height of buildings were amended, and construction technology began to evolve. The following year, a leading developer revealed a plan to build the Kasumi Gaseki building. The tower would be 36 stories high and the tallest in Japan. Kajima Corporation was already one of the country's largest construction companies. It entrusted the project to a leading specialist in structural engineering, 
Professor Kyoshi Muto of the University of Tokyo had developed a theory that would allow high-rise buildings to withstand Japan's frequent earthquakes. His idea seemed nonsensical according to basic construction principles of the times. It was believed that in order for a building to resist earthquakes, it had to be very sturdy. But sturdy structures were too heavy for high-rises. They'd collapse under their own weight. Engineers thought building quake-resistant skyscrapers was impossible. The theory of flexible structures, as its name indicates, focuses on the flexibility, or elasticity, if you like, of the structure. It's about building a frame that doesn't remain rigid. This feature is essential to make buildings safe against earthquakes. So the basic idea is to counter the impact of shock waves by making the structure flexible. Flexibility rather than sturdiness. This seemingly counterintuitive concept had its roots in ancient Japanese architecture. This five-story pagoda not far from the university campus was a familiar sight for Professor Muto. Built in the late 17th century, it had never collapsed in an earthquake. It was peculiar to me that a five-story pagoda had withstood earthquakes for centuries. I had heard that it once had collapsed because of strong winds, not an earthquake. It was so odd. I thought there had to be some sort of secret hidden in its structure. I was fascinated. Muto thought that the secret of the pagoda's resilience was in its ability to bend like a tree. Its timber frame tongue and groove joinery meant the energy of a shockwave could dissipate in the friction caused by its moving wooden parts. Muto applied this idea to the design of the Kasumi Gaseki building. He needed a material that was at once strong and flexible. A structure made with I-beams should respond to an earthquake like the wooden pagoda. Muto considered I-beams that were being used in other countries for building skyscrapers, but there were none that matched his requirements for flexibility. Kajima enlisted the help of a major steel manufacturer to develop a special type of I-beam. The beam would have to be 60 millimeters thick to be strong enough to sustain the building's weight. In addition, it would have to be made of a different alloy to improve flexibility. Muto still had doubts about whether a flexible structure would be strong enough to support a skyscraper. So he conducted tests using the most advanced computers available at the time. Muto fed the machine all the data he could find about earthquakes from around the world. He ran the tests over and over again to see if the structure would resist to the shock waves. He concluded the building could withstand an event three times stronger than the Great Kanto earthquake of 1923. Construction of the Kasumi Gaseki building began in 1965 with a team of Japan's elite workers. Workers had to bolt end-to-end 11-meter -end I-beam sections. Little by little, the building grew higher and higher. In adjusting the I-beams, a deviation of just one millimeter would compromise the integrity of the structure. Every tie was checked as many as 30 times. The monumental project required a combination of skill, muscle, and brain power. After three years of painstaking labor, 
the unprecedented project was brought to a successful completion. Japan's first skyscraper was the pride of Tokyoites. Flexible structures like the Kasumi Gaseki building set the standard for the construction of skyscrapers. Today, all high-rise buildings in Japan are built on the principles of strength and flexibility set forth by MUTO. The Kasumi Gaseki building proved that a building's flexibility greatly improved its quake resistance. That was just dandy for protecting infrastructure, but what about protecting the people and assets inside the building? A structure may be designed to hold up to the shaking, but it's a nightmare for the people inside who can be injured by moving and falling objects. The next level in earthquake protection was figuring out a way to limit the shaking inside a building. Researchers at Kajima developed ingenious damping systems that did the trick. The success of the Kasumi Gaseki building put Kajima at the top of the industry as a builder of skyscrapers. The company then took notice of an unorthodox architect who proposed a theory that had been dismissed by his peers as nothing but a wild dream. His name was Takuji Kobori, a professor at Kyoto University. Instead of letting buildings passively allow the shock waves to move through them, Kobori's idea was to make the structures cancel out the seismic waves. His concept of an unshakable building was published in 1960 as a world first. Driven by his determination to tame the power of earthquakes, he called his theory seismic control. One way of illustrating this concept is to look at people on trains. When the carriage sways, they try to maintain their balance by shifting their weight from one leg to the other, or by bending their knees. They don't just fall to the floor. Their muscles act as shock absorbers. The basic idea behind seismic control is applying this concept to the structure of a building. In 1986, Kobori was invited to set up his own research lab within Kajima Corporation. It was staffed with the youngest and brightest of the company's engineers. Norihide Koshika was one of them. At first, he wasn't convinced that the notion of response control could be applied to buildings. People around us felt we'd embarked on a rather strange kind of project. But after we started working on it, the idea gradually grew on us, and we started getting excited about it. Professor Kobori kept saying, whether now or in the future, earthquakes will remain unpredictable. He kept repeating that we needed to incorporate some kind of system into our buildings. I don't know how many times I heard him say that. To develop such a system, Kobori taught the young engineers a number of principles and methods on how to control seismic shock waves. Among those principles were altering the rigidity of the building's frame and using a device to absorb the oscillation of the structure. Kobori let his apprentices devise by themselves exactly how they were going to turn these ideas into practical applications. It took them three years to come up with a solution. They called their system Active Mass Driver, or AMD, and Koshika was a key player in its development. AMD is a seismic control device with a computer active control system. What kind of system is best to control, or how do we set the algorithm? First, we check the small model, and that leads to creating a larger model, and finally to the life-size prototype. Then we put the prototype on a shaking table to do more testing. If it goes well the first time, it means that the design is beginning to show signs of success. 
That is our process. This is the device. When the shock waves from an earthquake move through the building, the device counteracts the shaking. It was a revolutionary system. This is the main part of the device. It weighs four tons. It moves in a direction opposite to the movement of the building and cancels out the shaking. The building and the ground around it are fitted with sensors that relay data to this computer. In a split second, the computer analyzes the data and controls the weight to move in a certain way. The system starts reacting before people inside the building are even aware of an earthquake. This simulation demonstrates the effectiveness of the AMD system. The water in this tank clearly shows that the building is shaking. When the AMD system is switched on, the liquid stabilizes. This is the first example of a building fitted with the AMD system. The tall, thin structure makes it extremely vulnerable to swaying. A pair of AMD devices using different weights has made it capable of withstanding even complex twisting and swaying patterns called shear. Kojima's engineers conducted tests inside the building using machinery that replicate the vibrations of an earthquake. The AMD is activated. The turbulent water in the tank has gone almost still. The reverse swinging action of the AMD is controlling the building's shaking. The world's first seismic control building was born. Since then, engineers have been gathering data on the effectiveness of the system and how earthquakes affect the structure. Professor Kobori strongly believed in the importance of applying the results of his research, but more important still was to test their actual effectiveness. This first building was completed in 1989. That's more than 20 years ago already. But the system fared perfectly well during the earthquake of March 2011. Engineers at Kojima had succeeded at developing technology that could help protect buildings and people inside them from severe damage caused by large earthquakes. The damping systems used in the Roppongi Hills Mori Tower, which was completed in 2003, as we've seen, proved their efficiency in the March 2011 earthquake. But what about older buildings? Kojima engineers took the technology to a higher level, up to the rooftops. <laughs> On the afternoon of March 11, 2011, people in Tokyo stared bewildered at the buildings around them. This camera shows the business district of Shinjuku at the moment the earthquake struck. Here's a digitally stabilized version of the same images. A close-up reveals how seismic shock waves rocked the towers. They suffered no damage, precisely because they were designed to be flexible. But one phenomenon no one expected was that some of the buildings kept on swaying long after the earthquake had subsided. The engineers at Kojima offered me to experience what the earthquake would have felt like if I was on the 28th floor of one of these buildings at the time of the earthquake. Oh, this is quite surprising. I can sense how the building could be swaying quite a bit, especially the top, the top part of the building. 
The building rocked about a meter from its center and continued to sway for 10 frightening minutes. This long-lasting action was a result of seismic waves called long-period ground motion. This type of wave had rarely been observed before. The motion is so erratic and so unpredictable that I can imagine how discomforting it must be, especially for people who are sensitive to motion. So people who suffer from motion sickness, either car sickness or seasickness, this kind of shaking must be quite discomforting for them. The Shinjuku Mitsui building was designed by Kyoshi Muto and constructed in 1973 by Kajima Corporation. This office tower also swayed madly on the day of the earthquake. It suffered no significant damage, but management received complaints from the tenants. They were concerned about safety. The March 11th disaster prompted companies to upgrade their business continuity planning. After a disaster, they need to be able to continue operating their factories and to contact their clients. That's why it's essential for office buildings not only to remain safe, but to allow tenant companies to continue operating. This project encompasses all kinds of upgrades, from anti-seismic features to boosting the capacity of emergency power generators. Our goal is to bring the specifications up to current levels. Retrofitting older buildings with anti-seismic systems is now possible, making them just as efficient at damping shockwaves as modern constructions. Haruhiko Kurino is the man in charge of seismic upgrade projects for Kanjima Corporation. He joined Professor Kobori's research lab immediately after entering the company and spent many years improving anti-seismic technology. All the skyscrapers equipped with dampers fared well during the earthquake of March 2011. Kurino was hoping to rely on them again to retrofit the aging Shinjuku Mitsui building. But there was one problem. At first, we thought about installing X-shaped anti-seismic dampers here by the windows. But the problem is that they would block the view and obstruct more space inside. This would reduce the effectiveness of the floor space, so we abandoned that idea. Kurino found an area that had plenty of space, the rooftop. Kurino abandoned the idea of using oil dampers and decided to install a completely different type of technology. The new devices weigh 300 tons each. We're installing six of them here to protect this building from large earthquakes. That's our project. Kurino's system is called Tuned Mass Damper, or TMD. Like the AMD system developed in the late 1980s, this one uses counterweights like giant pendulums to reduce the swaying of a building. Oil dampers are used to control the motion of the pendulum and help absorb more efficiently the kinetic energy of the swaying building. The result is a structure that stabilizes more quickly after a major earthquake. The rooftop installation wouldn't bother tenant companies. So permission to go ahead with the project was granted. One of these giant pendulums is nearing completion at Kajima Corporation, so we headed out to take a closer look. Mr. Kurino. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. The pendulum weighs 300 tons and is held up by eight steel cables. The mass is made up of smaller, more manageable slabs of concrete that can be lifted by crane to the rooftop. This large TMD system is the first in the world designed to respond to megaquakes. I see, so it's never been tried before. Never. 
And the reason is the sheer weight of these 300-ton blocks. In a major earthquake, they swing over two meters. This system is the first capable of safely controlling the motion of such enormous weights. Engineers are anxious. Today, they're going to test the suspension system. This massive weight will be lifted off its support base for the very first time. The weight has to be perfectly distributed between the cables. If not, the system could malfunction. Workers fine-tune the weight distribution by adding or removing steel plates that form the base. Once in place, this TMD system will effectively halve the amplitude of the building's oscillation and reduce its swaying time by 83% in an event similar to the earthquake of March 2011. If the tests are conclusive, the 40-year-old Shinjuku Mitsui building will be fitted with these giant pendulums by next spring. The technologies we apply are based on different types of earthquakes and the building's profile. Devising the right strategy to prevent swaying or collapse is both the most difficult and the most interesting part of the job. Anti-seismic technology has come a long way since the 1960s, but much has yet to be understood about large earthquakes. Big earthquakes are not that easy to understand. They're driven by very complex factors. So we're really not yet at the stage where technology makes people completely safe and secure. We need to continue research and development in this field. All this anti-seismic technology for protecting high-rise buildings is truly a blessing. But what about low-rise buildings? Researchers came up with a concept called base isolation. The base isolation system separates the building from the ground. It's a mechanism that reduces the vibrations delivered from the ground to the structure by placing a device between the two. The type commonly used consists of laminated rubber with alternating layers of rubber and steel plates. This is not only strong enough to bear a weight of hundreds of tons, it is also elastic. Thanks to this base isolation device, many lives were saved at one hospital hit by the earthquake on March 11, 2011. The Red Cross Hospital in Ishinomaki is located relatively close to the epicenter. It's a core facility providing advanced medical treatment to an area with a population of 220,000. This footage shows the situation inside the hospital at the very moment the earthquake struck. The building is shaking, but machines like printers and PCs are not falling from desks and cabinets are not toppling. Dr. Tadashi Ishii, the man in charge of disaster preparedness, was carrying out surgery when the earthquake hit. Things were rattling, but we held on to them and nothing fell down. Our emergency power system started in about two seconds, including the electrosurgical instruments and the anesthesia apparatus, was reinstated. At the dialysis center, many patients were being treated on the day of the quake. Here, too, all systems remained operational. There was almost no damage to the hospital's infrastructure or to the equipment inside. Seismic isolation devices were installed in the hospital in 2006. Authorities had correctly predicted that a major earthquake would one day strike the region. The decision to install the dampers was made at the time the hospital was moved from its original location. 
hospital is fitted with 126 dampers. A single device can support more than 800 tons. There is a swing trajectory and there is also movement of the building. It has moved a maximum of 26 centimeters from the center. The device has absorbed that much amplitude. There were severe cracks in the ground around the hospital. Then we found out that the shaking inside the hospital was totally different from the outside surroundings. The disaster coordination team was established just four minutes after the earthquake occurred. Then the staff shifted their attention from what was going on inside the hospital to what was happening outside. Staff had created a disaster prevention manual and held thorough drills on a regular basis. Since they were unaffected by the earthquake, they could rapidly get on with preparations as described in the manual. We often receive praise for preparing a good manual and carrying out drills based on it. But that's not sufficient preparation for disasters. The crucial thing is whether or not the hardware was okay. Because all our hospital functions were in order, we were ready to respond to any type of injury or sick person. That's why nobody among the hospital staff panicked. The building's resistance was a huge factor. Forty minutes after the earthquake, a gigantic tsunami engulfed Ishinomaki. All 86 medical institutions in the area were knocked out of service. The Ishinomaki Red Cross Hospital was the only one that remained 100% functional. The injured began to arrive in droves. The hospital was soon packed with patients. The extent of the injuries was far beyond anything the medical staff had expected. They attended to their patients around the clock. We also could be the victims. Under such circumstances, how could we manage to do all these things? Basically, unless we realize proper anti-seismic construction methods, we cannot prevent injuries and deaths. The hospital's anti-seismic upgrades were decisive. Now, construction of a new medical ward pre-fitted with base isolation dampers will ensure the safety of staff and patients in future earthquakes. Seismic structural control technology can be applied not only to new buildings, but also to existing structures. And the same is true of base isolation technology. Tokyo Station is the capital's main rail hub. The building is registered as an important national cultural property, but the aging structure required large-scale restoration work to make it earthquake-proof. Engineers considered different approaches, including rebuilding from scratch. In the end, they chose to retrofit it using base isolation. When an earthquake occurs, it's like this. This is the base isolation device, which is designed to absorb the vibrations. If the building moves, this part here expands and contracts. This is where the movement is adjusted. That's how it works. Base isolation had another advantage. It would allow restoration work to proceed without having to make major changes to the building's appearance. Ordinary earthquake-resistant retrofitting would have required a huge amount of reinforcement work, such as strengthening 50% of the walls, including the brickwork inside. Because we wanted to preserve the existing elements as much as possible, the base isolation system was chosen. 
Tokyo Station had been partially destroyed in major events in the last 100 years. The Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923, and the aerial bombings of World War II. Tokyo Station had been built on a foundation of 10,000 pine pylons. In the recent upgrade, the pylons were removed and replaced with 352 base isolation devices. The building weighs about 70,000 tons and is 335 meters long. To replace its entire foundation, was a truly bold plan. The job was awarded to Kajima Corporation. It took more than five and a half years to complete the work. I was aware that with such a difficult project, my responsibility was enormous. Tokyo Station is a truly historic building, and it is an important cultural property of Japan. After all, it was important that businesses stayed open during the reconstruction work. We had some drawings to help us, but anyway, we first had to dismantle many parts to investigate the site. Most of the work had to be done in a dim light. We were basically fumbling our way around. Approximately half a million people pass through Tokyo Station every day. The station had to continue functioning. So the heavy construction work took place mainly at night. Workers dug out the pine piles one by one. Amazingly, after being buried in the earth for a hundred years, they were still in perfect condition. They smelt just like living pine trees. They were beautiful. We were so impressed by their condition. Once the pine piles had been removed, the base isolation devices were installed in the gaps between the ground and the building where temporary support columns had been placed. Restoration work on the outer red brick walls and interior features were carried out and completed at the same time. The success of the restoration of Tokyo Station proved that in Japan, regardless of the age or size of a building, it is possible to make it quake-proof. Earthquakes will always be a threat to people and infrastructure anywhere in the world. But evolution and innovation in anti-seismic technology is making buildings more resistant. So, the next time an earthquake strikes and you happen to be inside a modern skyscraper, rest assured that you are safer right where you are. I'm Marc Carpentier. See you on the next edition of JTech.